Today's episode features the 10 worst UK oil fields. We're looking at the UK continental shelf and uh, in particular you can see we're taking six examples from the northern and central North Sea, one from the Faroe Shetland Basin, one from the Outer Morif Earth and one from onshore UK. Now you probably noticed that's only nine. We'll come back to that later. What constitutes worst in our definition? Well, it could be massive underperformance of the field. It could be just a, an overpromise, a hype that uh, just isn't delivered. The uh, financial failure could, could lead to enormous write downs and ultimately a premature abandonment of the field. It could also uh, include design and engineering failures on the way. So everything seems rosy. All the conferences uh, and webinars I've been to over my career always seem to feature success stories and you know there's no taking away the oil and gas industry has done a phenomenal job in developing the UK reserves but is there no cloud to this silver lining I think there's something to be learned from our mistakes so a warning this may get uncomfortable um, now starting in no particular order Mariner Here's the Mariner platform, and it's recently been in the news here with talk of a $1.8 billion write-down, Equinor operate, and the reserves have fallen quite significantly. The partners, they all think that the uh, write-down is, is premature, but of the two sands, uh, one has been developed, the other one is yet to be developed. But you can see below, there is uh, the issue that the, the Maureen sand has actually got the better quality uh, oils within his, the Heimdall is order of magnitude greater viscosity. So here is the production profile for the field. It was expected to kind of be up at the sort of 55,000 barrels of oil a day mark. Um, it really managed to peak here um, at around about 40,000 barrels a day uh, and is kind of uh, declining away. The water cut development has been very, very aggressive, just getting straight up here to 70% and is now at around about 80%. So I'm sure attempts are ongoing to control water cut uh, development and, and manage that but it is very high for just 18 months into the production profile now on this slide i'm going to show this is our entry i won't talk to these on each of the subsequent slides but this is our entry from trove and you can see this is the material that we can instantly pick from to actually put together videos like this so next candidate well leaden leaden was a hundred percent kermagee and uh, this is a theme we might come back to, the, the level of equity. When it was sanctioned, 120 to 170 million barrels of reserves, and that was in Leiden and satellites, Burs and Glassell. Now, some injectite fields have been successes. Leiden was not one of them. This is what an injectite looks like at the bottom. I think this is probably overstating the uh, amount of injectites that, uh, that actually would be around. There was a massive write down and uh, Kermagee, proud of its 75 year history, um, after this uh, failure actually was targeted by corporate raiders and, and sold and eventually disappeared. Uh, throughout the field life, you know, 17.5 million barrels of oil equivalent was, uh, and mainly oil in fact, was, uh, was recovered. But you see it limped on for many years at uh, very low levels and uh, very high water cuts. So that's uh, Leiden. Fortunately, the uh, the vessel, the, the GP3, went on to see success at Dumbarton, and we'll hear more of that in a short while. The next candidate is Crawford. Well, the TW58, which was uh, about finishing up at Argyle, Hamilton Brothers, the operator, were looking for a a place to redeploy the vessel to. Uh, it got renamed the North Sea Pioneer and it was moved to the Crawford field. Now Crawford sits on the uh, the Crawford Ridge here. This is what the field looks like on a seismic. Uh, the hope was that uh, there'd be quite a, a good recovery uh, from Jurassic sands but most of the gross rock volume turned out to actually be Triassic which is a not as, uh, as as good a reservoir. You can see from the uh, production profile that the oil got up to about 11,000 barrels, but it, it quickly just sort of fell away. And I don't think we can actually see it down here, but uh, it was quite low levels. This is uh, two to 4,000 barrels a day. So it, it was looked at for uh, redevelopment, but uh, it's, that's never gone forward. And the field uh, was abandoned 
uh, having produced 3.9 million barrels of oil. Now, Northwest Hutton, this was a very, very large northern North Sea platform. You can see this immense jacket here and this uh, fantastic top sides featuring two drilling derricks. So um, they could drill two wells at one time. And um, it was a huge platform. Amoco were the operator. And you can see here a map at the top Brent Reservoir um, showing that it's actually highly faulted, highly compartmentalised, and there were issues with water injectors communicating with nearby producers. I think this image here, this is uh, fault blocks A, B and C on the Hutton field. Here's uh, Q West, and as you step down, this is Northwest Hutton. So you can see it's a lot deeper than Hutton. Now Hutton had some issues but uh, those issues were compounded as you got down to these deeper depths, um, diagenesis, the, it wasn't, uh, the permeability was a lot lower and uh, didn't deliver anything like it was supposed to um, when it was actually put in place. Now it did ultimately recover you know 124 million barrels of oil so it, it didn't do too badly but you can see it limped on for many many years here at quite low rates so probably not making an awful lot of money. Next up Lancaster. Well Lancaster has been in the news quite a lot and it's a hurricane with 100% equity out here west of Shetlands and uh, here's the location of Lancaster and, and some of the nearby fields that have too been in the news quite a lot recently. The field was developed with an FPSO, the Akoa Misu, and you can see that there was a subsea manifold here uh, and two producing wells were drilled. Now uh, one of these wells has, has since stopped producing so it actually uh, is just producing from one well with an, an electrical submersible pump which has been running well but when that pump decides to give up the ghost it's probably going to be the end of the field. The reservoir is, is fractured granite. It's, it's a rare reservoir but it's not unique and I think it's fair to say that uh, the intent here was always to put out an early production system. It was never a commitment to a full field development so this was like an extended well test but it has turned out to be the, the, the field development. This is the sort of um, geology that we're looking at uh, basically looking at these sort of fractures throughout the granite and this is where the oil would be. Uh, unfortunately when water comes up as well there really is no way to control or stop it. You can see here the, the oil rate uh, got up to around about uh, 18,000 barrels a day but has been uh, on, a, on a steady decline since then. The water has been controlled but I think uh, having to actually choke back some of the well, the, the one remaining well. To date um, it's produced 11.5 million barrels of oil uh, and it's still going and, and we hope it does uh, continue to keep going. For, for the investors it's been a real roller coaster ride and uh, you can see that of late the uh, oil price, uh, the, sorry the share price is, uh, is very low but since the oil price has picked up as have the shares. Uh, we've got an awful lot of information on this field should you want it. Derwood and Dauntless, well this was a Hess operated field and it was uh, back in the late 90s known in the industry as uh, colloquially as um, doubtful and dubious. The first well was drilled into, this is the map of the uh, the Fulmar Sands, the extent of them, and it found 186 feet. Now everything was going well but uh, the next two wells only found 11 and 30 feet. This well was uh, was completed. This one was um, the horizontal tail was put into it, and but the the bottom line was that the 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 oil in place, the the size of the resource, it just wasn't there. The field started in 1997. It was abandoned in 1999. This is the uh, Blue Waters Glass Dower. Um, you know, this was on a long-term contract, and this picture here, taken in dry dock in uh, Belfast, is is where it actually spent most of the time under contract, because the field uh, produced just 10.8 million barrels, and no more. Today's sponsors, uh, well, who wants to be associated with a bunch of failures? So we didn't accept sponsorship for this episode. But I'm very, very grateful to my uh, good friend Colin Percival, who will be known to many, a former PESGB president and uh, director of numerous companies, and very, very actively involved in UKCS exploration over many decades. Emerald. 
the next in the line. Um, so Midland Scottish Resources, uh, Sovereign, Neste Oil, um, that's the Finnish company, they operated this field. The field ultimately watered out prematurely, believed to be by uh, basement fractures. Now, there is some good quality, you know, Colovian uh, Jurassic Age sands. And here's the profile here. Started off at about 20,000 barrels a day, but uh, that declined away. So this was the uh, development scheme. It was a, a semi-sub tied back to a, a captive tanker with shuttle tankers coming in to, to offload. But this couldn't be sustained at these uh, these low rates here. And so um, back in 1996, the field was abandoned, just having produced 16.1 million barrels of oil. There have been attempts uh, by ATP. They looked at uh, the Octoboy development um, quite some time ago, but that was scrapped by the uh, the Chinese yard. Then of late, uh, Alpha Petroleum have uh, planned a redevelopment. It's uh, now known as Cheviot. And looking at a 22 well development, be interesting to to better understand why Emerald would work better second time round and what's going to be done differently. So Donan, um, I was very much involved in this in my uh, former life, having been subservice manager for the Dumbarton development. But it was actually before this we want to talk about, and this was back in the days when it was known as the Donan field, and it was uh, BP and Conoco who operated that. So it was the swaps vessel, Shalane, um, which was an FPSO, but it didn't actually have um, water injection facility or, or any other means of uh, artificial lift. So once the water cut developed, it became very, very difficult. Now, by swaps, the idea was to go around and um, harvest a number of fields and keep coming back and give the field time to recover. In the case, the other fields in the area didn't really uh, deliver, so uh, the vessel kept coming back to Donan probably more frequently than was initially intended. And then the rates just started to, to drop away and, and the wells were, were getting increasingly difficult to bring on, on stream having to shut them in every two weeks to sail to port to empty the vessel so around about 6.3 million barrels the field then was uh, was abandoned well along came Cam McGee and partners Noble Energy and uh, subsequently it became a, a major success as Dumbarton uh, using this uh, global producer three which had been at the lead and since uh, putting the, the same reservoir back on on stream having shot 3D seismic and, and learning that was actually a lot bigger than uh, than was uh, previously thought. The, the three fields here, these are a couple of deeper fields and, uh, and, and a local satellite. It's still producing, it's produced 91.6. So this is actually a success story, but uh, the initial development uh, unfortunately wasn't uh, quite the success it was hoped for. And now, the Gatwick Gusher. Well, this is the name that's bandied around the industry for the Horse Hill, and I think it's the headline that says it all. Up to 100 billion barrels discovered underground in the biggest onshore find for three decades. Shares have gone shooting up, and the expectation was that the field would meet 10 to 30% of the UK oil demand by 2030. So... Gatwick Gusher, there's the uh, there's Gatwick Airport, and Horse Hill is located just to the northwest of that. Here we can see the uh, the production profile. Now, unlike production profiles we've seen before, where it's in th um, many thousands of barrels, this is actually in barrels. So you can see it maxed out at around about two hundred and well, nearly two hundred and fifty, but now is down in the order of sort of sixty, seventy uh, barrels of oil per day. This is the total production. It's still ongoing and will go for some time. Now, in fairness to the uh, operator, UKOG, they did try and correct the uh, the, the press misinterpretations. Um, it really wasn't expected to ever be a, a major, massive oil field. It, it was, uh, I think, uh, a bunch of journalists who didn't quite understand. Uh, so rather than it being huge, it's actually been tiny. And, and the share price here, um, you know, has... has peaked at around about the time of, of all this uh, news breaking um, and then falling away and uh, at this level today. So our 10th candidate, well, we've left that blank. 
nominate your candidate in the uh, the comments below or or send uh, an email to me anonymously if uh, you don't want to be identified so um you know i'm sure we've missed one in this so here is our list you can see here we've got three fields that are still producing so you know it's still time to see if they can recover donan was redeveloped and maybe you've got your favorite for uh, this 10th slot. We thought some honourable mentions, um, Ardmore and Alma um, redevelopments. We've actually produced a video and the link is up there in the top right hand corner. So you can see here there's the Argyle field and it produced nearly 75 million barrels. There was a, a gap of about a decade and then it was redeveloped as Ardmore and it produced just shy of 6 million barrels. And then there was a gap of about a decade, and then it was uh, redeveloped as, as Alma and produced around about 6 million barrels. In total, the field has delivered nearly 87 million barrels. But I think if we actually close up these gaps here, you can see that uh, perhaps it might have been better off just leaving this field to, to run a couple of years. I mean, there may be a slight bit of flush production in here, but, but essentially the field got back on the same sort of decline curve and didn't really see anything new at all. So redevelopments can be challenging. We saw that the Dumbarton had been a major success, but Alma and Ardmore were not in that category. Uh, Solan uh, still producing. It's a thin reservoir, but uh, major cost overruns. The Lyle field, along with uh, Clumber E, they both uh, suffered from sort of poor quality reservoirs, so have very low recovery factors. The Staffer field, which tied back to the Ninian Southern platform, well, the flow line there waxed up. It was replaced, and then it waxed up again. So uh, that's not a not a great story. Athena produced only 8 million barrels and the failure of the electric downhole submersible pumps was um, one of the main reasons that production was curtailed. Hutton, Hutton was, a, was, a, was a successful field but for the initial partnership which was the CBG group you know it, it actually was a year late because of uh, cracks in, in the groundbreaking TLP platform and also there was uh, an expectation that uh, there was going to be a good aquifer support um, i think the first 11 wells were were all producers and, and then the next seven were uh, were water injectors and and had to retrofit um, a mega pump on there to to make it work. And, and i think another worthy mention is for the shelley field and uh, this was oil exco 13 side tracks were they were they trying to uh, turn the North Sea into a Swiss cheese. So what have we learned? Well, at the time that we make the financial decision to go ahead and develop oil fields, there is an expectation of a production profile and associated reserves. A huge investment is made and what needs to be realized is that these don't always work. As we sort of say here, you know, it is not shooting fish in a barrel. Some of the common themes we've pulled out of this is that most failures that we've listed result from subsurface issues. Many, many tens, hundreds or even billions of dollars are spent and lost on these developments. So uh, that's something that you know, perhaps the public may not realize. There is uh, an associated risk even at the point where you decide to spend all this money to develop a field. Um, we saw a, a couple of examples where 100% equity, and it could be a case that these companies are smoking their own dope. Joint venture partners, they are the best peer reviews. Notice three of the fields, uh, sort of similar, you know, they were deep and uh, diagenesis of the reservoir sands was a problem, then Northwest Hutton, Lyle and Columbia. You know, fields are often company makers, but the ones listed above, um, many of them have um, been company breakers. And the final uh, theme that we've pulled out of this, well, hype, the truth will out. Comment below, maybe you've got your favorite. Please subscribe, click the thumbs up and ring the bell if you want to be informed of our next videos. There's our details to get in touch. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to seeing you back on our channel next time.